Hi, our next guest is Denny Miller. And as happens, we are good friends, so it makes it really a delight to be able to interview him. You will remember Denny best probably from Gilligan's Island, from Wagon Train as Tarzan, and more recently as Gorton's spokesperson. Now, your dad was a PE instructor, so you sort of moved around from university to university as a kid? Well, kind of. Uh, dad was on the faculty at UCLA. Uh, they gave the physical education department the name of kinesiology just to confuse the students. <laughs> yeah, and, that would uh, do it. That would do it. And he had, uh, he was a PhD and eventually became the uh, chairman of the department and then wow. was on uh, President Kennedy's and President Eisenhower's Council for Youth Fitness. So that's how you really got involved in sports, sports. and the I athletics. was very so. fortunate uh, to play basketball for John Coach John Wooden at UCLA for three years back in the 50s. We hadn't won any national championships, but we had awfully good winning teams. Oh, yeah. I, he just was wonderful. I think he is probably the coach that is looked up to so much. No one is going to win 10 national championships out of uh, 11 seasons. There's too much parity, but uh, he was a poet in the locker room. He's no cursing. If you cursed, you'd been running forward for two hours, you would run backwards for a half hour. Oh my, oh, good yes. for him. And when he said, my goodness gracious sakes alive, you knew he was really, really mad. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> How did you go from the athletic department into acting? I know for a lot of SC and UCLA students, this does seem to happen. It does, just there, because of the proximity of Hollywood, right. yeah. but. I, I was, uh, they get the uh, jocks jobs, the athletes jobs in the summer, usually physical jobs to keep them in shape, and mine was uh, that summer moving furniture for Beacon's van and storage, and I was pushing a chair down Hollywood Boulevard, and I heard over my shoulder someone yell, hey, come here and let me see your hairline. Now, I knew there were a lot of kooks around, and <laughs> so I figured this was one of them. I went over and and pulled my hair back and uh, said, how's that, and turned to go. And he said, here's my card, uh, give me a call. And I looked as he drove off, and it was Robert Raison, uh, theatrical agent. Uh, it's one of those um, happy accidents that happen to you. Um, life is kind of what happens to you when you're on your way to do something else. and. Uh, uh that was a life-changing experience for me because uh, within three weeks I had a screen test and uh, then I was under contract and uh, didn't know what the heck I was doing. Now, <laughs> what studio did you? I was at Review first mm -hmm. and then um, MGM bought my contract uh, from Review before I had worked a day. So, <laughs> and then... Wow. Uh, I got a sc another screen test. The first one was really difficult, like a personality test. You, they ask you questions like, uh, what's your name and how old are you? And, <laughs> <Real> and <laughs> very difficult stuff, questions. Yeah. And uh, the next one was uh, a play, a scene from a play called uh, The Voice of the Turtle, a comedy. And it was directed by George Cukor. Now, I wow. uh, didn't know who George Cukor was. And uh, uh, his name didn't come up in the gym very often. <laughs> and uh, so <laughs> afterwards, uh, when we were rehearsing, uh, I finally found out. And then I was nervous as a cat. And, uh, yeah. But with his name directed by on the screen test, I didn't, what were they going to do? <laughs> oh, <laughs> so yeah. wow. MGM bought it, uh, my contract. And... Uh, then I worked a couple of uh, lines in a film called Some Game Running with Sinatra and Dean Martin, Shirley MacLaine. Oh. I, um, I'll show you how relaxed Dean Martin was. I had rehearsed my two lines 145 million times. 
and I ran into this scene. Vincent Minnelli was the director, and I was really, really scared. I ran in and slid into the booth in this restaurant bar and gave my first line to Dean Martin, and he was playing with these scrambled eggs. And I waited, and I waited for his line, and finally he looked up and said, I got lines? <laughs> And he didn't know, he, he hadn't even read the script. Oh and he boy. said, uh, would somebody please hand me the script so I can get, it relaxed me, I must say. <laughs> uh, because uh, he didn't have, had no idea what, what was going on. And was having a good time. I never saw him not having a good time. Anyway, that's what happened. I, yeah. uh, on my way to be a basketball coach, I knew I wasn't good enough at, as a player to make a living at it in the NBA, but I could coach, and that's what I was going to be. And I'm thankful now, after 52 years of this silly business uh, called show, uh, that I look at basketball coaches racing up and down the sidelines with their oh veins yeah. popping out, and yeah. I, s I, I would have had a heart attack 15 years ago if I had been a basketball coach. So I'm very, very happy for Robert Raison. Who was your favorite director to work with? Blake Edwards, I believe, in a movie called The Party with Peter Sellers. Um, he, uh, they're only, usually a movie script is around 120 to 150 uh, pages. Uh, yeah. They only had 30 pages. And the second <laughs> day, they threw it away. And Blake called the actors and actresses together and said, we're going to make up this film, follow that man, and pointed at Peter Sellers, who I really think was a comic genius. And we did for 12 weeks. It was the most fun I had in 50, 52 years of watching and being able to work with a comic genius who spent his life, professional life, making people laugh. And I, I envy him to this day for his talent and his ability to make people laugh. Oh, on screen, he he was really magic on screen. He the was stuff he did he was. was outrageous and wonderful. And uh, but before I forget, I I have you've you've heard about people lip syncing, but I I probably no one in the audience has ever heard of people uvula syncing. This is what that. And that's how I did the yell. <laughs> I sounded like a wounded yak <laughs> during my <laughs> Yeah, during you my said yell. what? They used Johnny Weissmuller's yell They did a, a version of Johnny Weissmuller's. Yeah. He was the closest of the uh, 22. There have been 22 guys play the monkey man. Uh, and Johnny was best at it because he could yodel. His parents were from Germany. And, uh, I never uh, thought of it that way, yeah. but of course. Other than him, I think Carol Burnett does a great job. <laughs> and anybody being lowered slowly into a bathtub full of ice cubes, that comes close too. But me, I sounded like a wounded yak. Now, you got to do a TV series with Juliet Prowse. Well, it was a dirty job, but somebody, you know, had to do it. Mona I McCleskey, her, I really liked that, that series. That was a good series. Yeah. Sadly, we were up against Thursday night at the movies, and uh, on our premiere night, we were ranked 65th out of 58 shows, <laughs> which was, uh, and we stayed yeah, that there seems to in, that, a bit. in that place. Oh. Yes, it was, it was a joy to do 26 episodes with her, and for some strange reason, uh, I, I, they've disappeared. They, I've never seen them oh, on. Really? No, I've never seen them. If uh, anybody out there knows where Meet Mona McCluskey, a half-hour sitcom with Ju starring Juliet Prowse, well, they is. had some good writing on oh, that. Oh, they did. Yeah. They're marvelous. Marvelous. It was created by a guy by the name of Don McGuire, who had been a sports writer in Chicago and came to Hollywood and became an actor, and then he became a writer. Uh, and uh, his last thing, he was a co-writer for Tootsie. He was a very talented oh. man. He created Hennessy, wow. uh, Tootsie. Uh, he and uh, Gebhardt were uh, nominated for um, an Oscar. It didn't win, but he was nominated for the writing of, of Tootsie. 
and he was one of the funniest men in the world, but for some reason or other, he didn't get along with George Burns, and George Burns was assigned as an associate producer, and, oh, and Don wow. said, I'll, I'm busy doing something else, so I'll, I'll go away, <laughs> and he did, and we never saw him again, but George Burns was fun to listen to. We were supposed to be rehearsing every Monday, and we never got a rehearsal done because George Burns would sing his little ditties and, and tell <laughs> jokes the whole time. <laughs> And so we, we enjoyed that very much for 26 weeks. Yeah. Well, you did so many TV guest appearances over the years. I mean, you, you did the series and you did Wagon Train, what, for four years? Yes, 110 episodes. That was, that was my classroom because I'd, I really was a misplaced basketball player. <laughs> and uh, I had never done anything in the theater and so Every week they would have a big name star, and I worked with Betty Davis and Barbara Stanwyck and Robert Ryan and wow. it's quite even a class John room. Wayne. Yeah, uh, a, a different one each each e uh, week, and that was where I learned a little bit about the craft of acting. Other than working on the series, what was your favorite TV guest spot? Uh, I think on Gunsmoke, I, I played a character called Lijah. The episode was called Lijah, um, and, and uh, he was a deaf mountain man, and uh, that was very exciting and a very good part for me, but I, I can't ignore uh, going to Gilligan's Island twice. Uh, <laughs> uh, when you showed up in the morning, Jim Bacchus had already turned into Mr. Magoo, and he was Mr. Magoo from 8 in the morning till 8 at night. So it was hard not to laugh. I played uh, Tongo the Ape Man. And they captured me and put me in a, a I cage. That yes. Episode. <laughs> and another one is equally as ridiculous. I showed up on the island on a tsunami. A surfer. <laughs> a surfer. <laughs> and, uh, and, and those, those two episodes were probably <laughs> ranked right up there with the most fun I had. I would. If I had my druthers, I would have only had done uh, comedy. It's a joy, a wonderful feeling to know that you've been able to relax people and, uh, and, and m make them laugh. Well, I did, sadly, because of my size and my ability to do uh, uh, fights, I got a, a lot of very violent parts. And I figured that the only thing that um, made it worthwhile was that if, if I got a violent part, I would try to make it so violent that anyone who saw it would be so frightened that they would never want to go near violence. And I got pretty good at it. <laughs> and uh, that's very unusual for a devout coward. <laughs> oh, yeah. Now, you've written a couple of books. I have, and it surprised me more than anybody. Yeah. I, I wrote a book about my, uh, at the time, uh, 50 years in this business. It's called, Didn't You Used to Be What's-His-Name? <laughs> and that's You've what I get a lot. you to read it. It's <laughs> absolutely wonderful. You'll howl all the way through. Well, thank you. Thank you. And then, uh, because of my degree in physical education from UCLA, uh, I wrote and dedicated a book to my father. Uh, called Toxic Waste, W-A-I-S-T, Get to Know, K-N-O-W, Sweat. And it's a wake-up call for our younger generation that are gaining so much weight that they are getting diabetes too. And uh, for the first time in our country's history, uh, this generation will not live as long as their parents. Yeah, that's and scary. And it's a sad, sad situation. The only parts of their bodies that are in shape are their thumbs. And uh, that's a sad thing. Uh, they're kind of like under house arrest, you know? Yeah. Now, any questions out there? Uh, way in the back. How long was uh, Pete Conical McCluskey? Uh, one season, yeah. one season of 26 episodes. If it hadn't been uh, for Julia Prowse, who had signed a contract for 26 episodes, we would have been off in two. <laughs> but uh, it wasn't that bad a shot. It oh, was, a, was, was a good, good. good funny show. Uh, it, 
if you don't get more numbers watching you than whoever's on the other networks, then you're not going to be on very long. And uh, that's what happened to us. Otherwise, I, I, it would have been, uh, I think, one of those that lasted six or seven years. Yeah, I mean, the few shows like what Norman Lear did, where they gave it a chance to build the audience mm -hmm. and all, I mean, sometimes they really, you know, stayed on long enough to get that audience and really surprise people, and yes. then they became classics. But yes. if you didn't have that opportunity, it was really rough. A gentleman here in the front, yes, sir? You mentioned Martha Stanwyck, uh, working with her. She's renowned for being the perfect specimen as an actor and working with a crew. Did you find it that way? Yes, I did. Uh, she was uh, all professional, very. And uh, I remember one day in particular, it was getting late in the evening, and uh, we were uh, prone, young and foolish, and uh, at least I was, and joking around the set. And uh, she was dressed in her Confederate hat and her bull whip and everything, and we had another scene to do. <laughs> And we heard her voice very quiet and calmly saying, come on, guys, let's do the, do the jokes, and then we can go home. <laughs> she was uh, very professional, very kind, and very giving actress, yes. Uh, yes, sir. I always like to ask people that have appeared on Gunsmoke what memories they have of Amanda Blake. Sadly, uh, uh, she was not in the episode that I did. Uh, I think she was not even longer on the on the on the show. Uh, I was impressed with uh, Mr. Ernest mainly because he had scared the heck out of me playing the, a thing called the Thing, mm. and and it's one of the best horror films I've ever seen to this date. I don't watch them anymore because the older I get, the more frightened I get. <laughs> but but uh, it was interesting to me because. I found out later he had been injured in his feet uh, during the war, and his first question before every scene was, do I have to put my boots on? And, and they would us. usually cut him at, up above the waist so that he didn't, so he wouldn't, and he was more comfortable that way. I don't think we knew that about mm -hmm. him. Yes, sir? Uh, one of my favorite films of all time is The Party with Peter Sellers. And they did a brilliant role you had in that one. But how was it working with Peter Sellers? Was there a lot of improv going on? All of it was. All of it was. That was a totally, from start to finish, that was a totally made up film. I didn't know I was going to shake his hand and crush it. I didn't know, you know, and, and it was a delight. Uh, you know something special is going on when all the actors and actresses in the, the uh, cast are there on the set and on a day they don't have to work. And they're there for one reason and one reason only is to watch a genius at work. And that's what happened every day for 12 weeks. People could go home and enjoy themselves, do whatever they'd. They were there on the set watching Peter Sellers work. And, and uh, Steve Franken, who got progressively drunker during the show, uh, I think he had one half a page of stuff to do in the original 30 pages that they threw away, and his part just got getting bigger and bigger, and so did mine. I, I, I only had a few uh, things to do on that 30, original 30-page 30 script, but uh, he had two, two things. He, he didn't want anybody behind the camera except the operator when he worked, and that's not unusual. And the second was he didn't want anybody to wear purple, and nobody knew why, but nobody wore purple. <laughs> and what that's, a strange. That's, yeah, isn't that strange? Well, actors are notoriously superstitious. That's right. That might have been a superstition so. of his because nobody, and I mean nobody, and there were quite a few people in the cast, uh, wore purple. Wow. Okay, uh, another question? Anybody else? Yes, sir. Well, uh, working with animals when you were doing Tarzan, any ex interesting uh, experiences? Quite a few. Just to mention two, 
uh, let's see, uh, the, the chimpanzee trainer told me before the shoot started that you, uh, if he bites you, punch him. Because <laughs> he's going to, no matter where he bites you, he's going to take part of you away. And, and uh, uh, yeah, there was one scene where they sent the chimp in and he grabs my hand and, he's, and then the trainer who's behind the camera calls to him and I don't let him go. Well, he's not going to have any of that. So he chomped the meaty part of my hand uh, and I came up and he was still hanging by his teeth. Uh, so I punched him in the nose and it took him a half an hour to get him down from the rafters. <laughs> 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 and uh, let's see, what else? Well, um, they, uh, <laughs> the elephant was a circus elephant, and they brought him in. He was dying. He had a poison arrow in him, and they, they had a, a socket for the arrow, and then it flayed out, and they glued that, looked like skin, to it, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I, was instructed to push down on that so it wouldn't come off while I pulled the arrow out. Well, I did, and the, and the elephant backfired. <laughs> he, <laughs> and he let go, and <laughs> the difference between an elephant backfire and a bar room is uh, a cocktail lounge. One's is a bar room, and one is a bar room. <laughs> And I kept going. I turned to Jane, and I was explained, and <laughs> Jane wasn't there. <laughs> and I, t I turned around, <laughs> and the camera was on a boom, and the, the operators weren't there. <laughs> and they were just swinging chairs, empty chairs. And um, that's <laughs> what happened. And they uh, got the elephant up and took him off to the elephant bathroom, and then he came <laughs> back. And, <laughs> and <laughs> that happens. Uh, the chimpanzees uh, get dangerous when when they're uh, five, six. I don't know what exactly, but they do. And so the the trainer has one that you use, and then one a little younger, and one a little younger, so he doesn't ca get caught without because they ship them off to zoos. And uh, that's why he told me to punch him because. Uh, the guy who played the role after, I was number 12. Number 13 was a guy by the name of Mike Henry played Tarzan. He was a linebacker for the LA Rams and a tough guy and a wonderful guy. And he was working with his chimp in Brazil and been carrying him around for two or three weeks like this. And he leaned over and 72 stitches later, they put Mike's chin back on. Wow. They, they get really mean. They don't know why. But they do, and so uh, if you get, don't pet chimpanzees, if, especially if they got a gray beard. <laughs> <laughs> you know, on that happy note, we're out of time. Oh, well, Darn well, that, it. That went pretty fast, didn't it? It did, and having such fun, and I really want to thank you for doing this. By the way, can, can I tell everybody about your book, the Cowboy Cookbook? Oh, yeah, because yeah. you're well, in it, too. Well, I, I, I stole my wife's, Nancy's salmon recipe and it's great it's wonderful you'll and love it the reason i know it's great is that your husband larry d wouldn't eat salmon yeah. and he we couldn't keep him away he was eating the props <laughs> and 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 now he has it two or three times a week doesn't he yeah oh he absolutely flipped over it it is a great recipe you'll all love it and the book thank you for coming and Hope you stay for the next segment.